the Jewish people, legal owners or illegal occupiers of the land of Israel. Israel's original land title deed, the 1922 League of Nations mandate for Palestine. I owe a great deal of gratitude to Mark Vandermoss, Canadian founder of IsraelTruthWeek.org, whose pioneering advocacy I have liberally drawn upon in this presentation. Since most of you are neither lawyers nor historians, I will present an advocacy approach designed by Mr. Vandermoss, showing that the mandate for Palestine under international law is the legally binding original land title deed to the land of Israel given to the Jewish people by the nations of the world in 1922. The Palestinian Arabs are the original indigenous peoples of Palestine. The Jews stole our land and are illegal occupiers of Palestinian Arab land. Jewish settlers illegally build on West Bank Arab land. We hear these claims all the time, but are they true? All our lives, most of us have thought that there does not exist Israel's original land title deed to the land of Israel given to the Jewish people by the nations of the world. Wouldn't it be great if we had it? If I could show you a document proving that the accusation of Jews stealing land is false, would you want to see it? Well, we do have it. It's the 1922 League of Nations mandate issued exactly 100 years ago today, on July 24th, 1922, which you can read and should read yourself. Only 2% of most Jewish people have ever read it. Some of our considerations in addressing this subject will be the following. The truth, the mandate document exists, and the truth of its existence is enough to directly refute the stolen land propaganda and the entirely false narrative that has been completely fabricated out of thin air that Israel has no legal rights to the land. Truthful terminology. We need to use truthful terminology and not myths to gain control of the narrative. We should refer to Judea and Samaria, not the West Bank or occupied territories, to reconstitution of the Jewish people, not colonization by the Jewish people, that Israelis residing in Judea and Samaria are citizens, not foreign settlers, and that the document is called the League of Nations Mandate for Palestine, not the British Mandate for Palestine. Have international promises to the Jewish people been kept or not? Did the nations of the world in 1922 make promises to the Jewish people in the mandate for Palestine or not? Did the nations of the world sub subsequently keep their promises to the Jewish people or not? Can the Jewish people trust and rely on the nations of the world to keep their promises in any future agreement regarding Jewish ownership of the land of Israel or not? The Jewish people are the most oppressed murdered, ill-treated, discriminated against, and hated people in history. The Jews have a moral right to know whether Jews can trust the world's promises, telling Jews to rebuild their ancient home. The mandate for Palestine recognizes the ownership by the Jewish people of the land of Israel and by no other people. Menachem Begin said in 1981, at all times, and whatever the cost, safeguard the dignity and the honor of the Jewish people. The Jews and Israelis have suffered indignity and dishonor too long by being falsely accused of illegally stealing and occupying so-called Palestinian land. The mandate for Palestine exists, and it refutes these sordid and untrue allegations. We and the world have a duty to preserve Jewish dignity and honor and show that the international community has already recognized Jewish national rights in the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. 
three key documents in the evolution of the mandate for Palestine. I want you to keep in mind during this presentation the three key documents, tracing the evolution of the mandate for Palestine, recognizing the Jewish people as the sole owners of the land of Israel. The first is the Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, 1917, a statement of policy whereby Britain became the first nation in the world to recognize Jewish ownership rights in the land of Israel. The second is the San Remo Conference Resolutions of April 25th, 1920, which adopted the Balfour Declaration as a resolution for the League of Nations establishment of the mandate for Palestine and recognized the legal entity of Palestine for the first time in more than 1800 years. And third, the mandate for Palestine of July 24th, 1922, which recognized as a matter of international law, sole Jewish national and political rights to Palestine. The Mandate for Palestine, a brief history. The Mandate for Palestine is an act of international law unanimously adopted by the 51 member League of Nations, the nations of the world, after its confirmation on July 24th, 1922, recognizing and granting only to the Jewish people as the only indigenous native people of that land, a national homeland in Palestine. The mandate incorporates word for word and codifies the Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, 1917. It recognizes, quote, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and, quote, the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. I will discuss the mandate in detail later. The mandate for Palestine is one of three Class A mandates adopted by the League of Nations. The importance of the Class A mandates is that this category is reserved only for former Turkish territories considered, considered to be sufficiently advanced such that their provisional independence already was recognized. However, they were still subject to allied administrative control until they were fully, quote, able to stand alone. In other words, a provisionally independent Jewish state was envisioned in the language of the mandate under Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, which created a total of 14 mandates. The other two Class A mandates are Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia, or Iraq. The mandate for Palestine is a remarkable and a profoundly Zionist document. The words Jew, Jewish, and Zionist appear 14 times in its 11 pages. It recognizes the national and the political rights of the Jewish people only and of no other people and constitutes the legally binding codification into international law of the policy set out in the Balfour Declaration as resolved by the San Remo Conference into inalienable Jewish national and Jewish political rights in Palestine. It constituted binding international law up to the date that the British ended the mandate, mandate and withdrew from Palestine at midnight on May 14th, 1948. The British ended their role as mandatory or trustee due to, quote, frustration of purpose. With a declaration of independence by the State of Israel on May 14th, 1948, the mandate for Palestine expired. However, the national, quote, acquired legal rights, close quote, of the Jewish people in the mandate of Palestine and the obligation of the nations of the world to reconstitute the Jewish national home in Palestine remain valid to this day under Article 80 of the UN Charter and under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties signed in 1989. Under the international legal doctrine of uti posseditus juris, which means that a new state's borders are the same as before, Israel's borders were and are 
the exact same borders as the previous borders of mandatory Palestine. The United Nations welcomed Israel as a member state on May 11th, 1949, completing the legal steps to Jewish statehood in the Western part of Palestine that began with the Balfour Declaration, the San Remo Conference resolutions, and the Mandate for Palestine. At the time of the Mandate, the League of Nations consisted of 51 countries of the world, including the major countries, except for the United States, which never joined the League of Nations. However, the United States adopted the identical wording of the Mandate for Palestine in a separate treaty with Great Britain in 1924. This treaty was unanimously ratified by the US Congress in 1925 and became US law under the Supremacy Clause Article 6 of the US Constitution. The League of Nations member numbers peaked at 58 countries in 1934. At the end of World War II and the League's dissolution on April 19, 1946, the League of Nations was superseded by the United Nations. The UN Charter in Article 80, the so-called Palestine Article, extended the application of the mandate for Palestine by stating, quote, nothing in this chapter shall be construed in or of itself to alter in any manner the rights whatsoever of any states or any peoples or the terms of existing international instruments to which members of the United Nations may respectively be parties. In other words, the mandate for Palestine remained valid. The mandate originally gave to the Jews all the land both west of the Jordan River and also east of the Jordan River. However, the Eastern Jewish land of Palestine was detached two months later to create Transjordan, the king, which became the Kingdom of Jordan in 1922. This, in fact, was the original two-state solution in 1922. Mark Vandermoss says that God-believing people can see, quote, the fingerprints of God all over the mandate for Palestine as it is perfectly synchronized with the Bible. The mandate for Palestine is the original land title deed for the land of Israel given to the Jewish people by the nations of the world in 1922. The Balfour Declaration, the famous 67 words. During World War I, following Zionist organization lobbying and in order to garner Jewish support in the United States and Russia for the war effort and to reward the Zionist, not Zionist organizations, Chaim Weizmann, for developing a form of acetone, a synthetic explosive, Arthur Balfour, the foreign secretary of Britain under Prime Minister David Lloyd George, on behalf of the British cabinet, issued on November 2nd, 1917, a statement of policy known as the Balfour Declaration. The declaration states that, quote, his majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. This was the first time that any government had recognized and maintained a policy of Jewish national rights to Palestine. The Covenant of the League of Nations. In January 1920, the League of Nations was established. The Covenant is the first part of the Treaty of Versailles of 1919 and introduced the new concept of a mandate or a trust to help former colonies and possessions of the Central Powers achieve, quote, self-determination until they were ready for independence. Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations called the Mandates Article, states, quote, certain communities formerly belonging to the Turkish Empire have reached a stage of development where their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognized subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as they are able to stand alone. 
the San Remo Conference resolutions. In April 1920 in San Remo, Italy, four of the principal allied powers, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, with the United States as an observer, met to deal with the former Turkish possessions of Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia, or Iraq. The San Remo Conference achieved the following. First, they heard, had heard presentations by both Jews and Arabs regarding their rights in Palestine. Second, for the first time in over 1800 years since Roman times, Palestine became a, nas a national legal entity again, ending the longest colonization known in history by the Romans, the Byzantines, the Sassanid Persians, the Arabs, the Crusaders, the Mamluks, and the Turks. Third, they approved the final framework of a peace treaty with Turkey, later signed at Sevres and replaced by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, and they abolished the Ottoman Empire and obliged Turkey to renounce all rights over Arab Asia and North Africa. Four, they created the three Class A mandates for Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia. And five, they incorporated the full text of the Balfour Declaration, the full text into their resolution regarding the proposed mandate for Palestine. And they also included the entire area of Palestine, including the modern states of Israel and Jordan in the mandate. The Mandate for Palestine. On July 24th, the League of Nations Council or Executive Body approved the, late Le the League of Nations Mandate for Palestine, which recognized the Jewish people as the future owners of Palestine. Let's look closely at its, position, its, at its provisions. The document consists of two parts. The first is the Mandate for Palestine. And the second is the troublesome note by the Secretary General, that's of the League of Nations, relating to its application to the territory known as Transjordan under the provisions of a new Article 25, incorporating and approving Britain's memorandum. And we'll get to the second part later. The preamble. Please note, the preamble is not merely a series of declarations. It is legally incorporated into Article 2 of the mandate. In the mandate's preamble, the Council of the League of Nations cites five important recitations. First, whereas the provisional allied powers, that's Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, who adopted the San Remo resolution, have agreed for the purpose of giving effect to the provisions of Article II, that's the mandate's article of the Covenant of the League of Nations, to entrust to a mandatory selected by the said powers, that's Britain, the administration of the territory of Palestine, which formerly belonged to the Turkish Empire, within such boundaries as may be fixed by them. And later, there were adjustments to the border with Lebanon, the headwaters of the Jordan River, the Golan Heights, a slice of land in the Sinai, and of course, the loss of Eastern Palestine across the Jordan, Jordan River. Second, whereas the principal allied powers have also agreed that the mandatory, that's Britain, should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November 2nd, 1917, that's the Balfour Declaration, by the government of His Britannic Majesty and adopted by said powers in favor of the establishment in Palestine. Is this all of Palestine? Yes, under the principle of an international law known as uti posedidus juris, of a national home. Is that a state or just a home? It's a state, why? This was the entire purpose of the mandate system, especially for the three class A mandates. It being clearly understood that nothing should be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Note that there is no mention of national or political rights of these communities. Third, whereas recognition has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine, and remember that both the Jews and Arabs presented their cases previously, 
the principal allied powers accepted the Jews case and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. And note the important word reconstituting and not creating. After being dispossessed for 18 centuries, the Jewish people were restored as the sole surviving indigenous native people of the land of Israel, deserving of self-determination and a reconstituted state. The mandate of Palestine was actually sui generis, meaning one of a kind, compared with the mandates of Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, in that its national beneficiaries were the 14 million Jews worldwide at that time, rather than just the local Jewish inhabitants. Fourth, whereas the principal of allied powers have selected his Britannic majesty as the mandatory or the trustee for Palestine, now the Jews at that time, based on the Balfour Declaration and other pro-Zionist government sentiment in Britain, and the conquest of Palestine by British General Allenby favored Britain to be the mandatory. Uh, there really wasn't any other choice. And fifth, whereby his Britannic majesty has accepted the mandate in respect to Palestine and undertaken to exercise it on behalf of the League of Nations. Again, please always note that this was not, this was the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, not the British mandate for Palestine as it is commonly misnamed. Britain was to be the administrator or the midwife to the birth of the Jewish state, not its new colonial master or the promoter of an Arab state in Palestine in its place, which later unfortunately occurred. Now we'll get to the terms of the mandate. If you haven't read this before, you're reading it now. I'll emphasize six articles relating to the Jewish people's ownership of the land of Israel under the mandate. Article two, the mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country into such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home as laid down in the preamble. This is the incorporation of the preamble into the main provisions and the development of self-governing institutions. Jewish national home in the context of the covenants, Article 22, discussing provisionally independent states, ultimately means the Jewish state. The development of self-governing institutions, of course, is necessary for this goal. Article 4, an appropriate Jewish agency shall be recognized as a public body for the purpose of advising and cooperating with the administration of Palestine in such economic, social, and other matters as may affect the establishment of the Jewish national home and the interests of the Jewish population in Palestine. There is no mention of a comparable non-Jewish organization or non-Jewish interests. The Zionist organization shall be recognized as such agency. It shall take steps in consultation with his British Ma Britannic Majesty's government to secure the cooperation of all Jews who are willing to assist in the establishment of the Jewish national home. The Zionist organization is specifically mentioned, as is the prospect of this organization securing the cooperation of all Jews worldwide for the establishment of the Jewish national home. Does this include Jewish immigration to Palestine? Yes, under Article 6. Article 5, the mandatory shall be responsible for seeing that no Palestine territory shall be ceded or leased to or in any way placed under the control of the government of any, any foreign power. The permanent inalienability of the land of Israel in favor of the Jewish people is underscored by this article. In Article 6, the administration of Palestine shall facilitate Jewish immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage in cooperation with the Jewish agency referred to in Article 4, close settlement by Jews on the land, including state land and wastelands not required for public purposes. These are lands that were available. Britain is mandatory is to, fac is to facilitate Jewish immigration and not to restrict it as ultimately occurred. 
Britain is to encourage Jewish close, Jewish close settlement of the land, including state and wastelands owned by the previous Turkish government. No such right is given to the Arabs. Article seven, the administration of Palestine shall be responsible for enacting a nationality law. There shall be included in this law provisions framed so as to facilitate the acquisition of Palestinian citizenship by Jews who take up their permanent residence in Palestine. Nationality and citizenship are attributes of nationhood. Britain is to facilitate Jewish citizenship. There is no mention of Arab citizenship. And Article 11, the administration may arrange with the Jewish agency mentioned in Article 4 to construct or operate any public works, services, and utilities, and to develop any of the natural resources of the country. Question, how can anyone read the mandate for Palestine and state that it does not recognize Jewish national rights to the land of Israel? It is absolutely clear that the international community, the nations of the world and the League of Nations made explicit legal promises to the Jewish people in the mandate for Palestine, establishing the mandate for the purpose of guiding the quote, provisionally independent area of Palestine into full statehood. All the other 13 class A and class B mandates became states. And yet no one today argues about either the validity of their existence or of their borders. Can you think why? The detachment of Eastern Palestine to Transjordan. Some 78% of the mandate for Palestine was the territory of Eastern Palestine, initially included in the mandate for Palestine in July 24th, 1922. However, at the time of the mandate, a deal was already pre-cooked, whereby Britain had decided to give Eastern Palestine to the Hashemite Emir Abdullah bin al Hussein as a reward for him and his family rebelling against the Turks in World War I. And it was for purposes of legally positioning itself against the French that Britain first included Eastern Palestine in the mandate with an option to detach it later. And two months later, on September 13th, 1922, Eastern Palestine was detached as the mandate of Transjordan with Abdullah as ultimately as the king. The second document in the, of the July 24th, 1922 mandate for Palestine, the note by the secretary general relating to its application to the territory known as Transjordan under the provisions of article 25 of the mandate affects this detachment transaction. And it states in the territories lying between Jordan and the Eastern boundary of Palestine, that's toward Iraq, as ultimately determined, the mandatory shall be entitled with the consent of the Council of the League of Nations to postpone or withhold applications of such provisions of this mandate. The British clearly envisioned severing Eastern Palestine from Western Palestine for their own political reasons. Britain submitted a memorandum to the Secretary General, which was incorporated in the note. It invited the League of Nations Council to pass a resolution that the provisions of the mandate for Palestine are not applicable to the territory known as Transjordan. Transjordan it's, was described as, quote, all territory lying to the east of a line from a point two miles west of the town of Aqaba on the Gulf of that name, up the center of the Wadi Arabah, the Dead Sea, the River Jordan, to its junction with the River Yarmouk, and thence up the center of that river to the Syrian frontier. You can see on the map in front of you the uh, Zionist map of the requested borders of the Mandate of Palestine. The Zionist organization had presented to the San Remo Conference a map including, I'll go back to that, a map including land east of the Jordan River, whereby two and a half 
of the biblical 12 tribes of Israel, that's Reuben, God, and half of Manasseh, dwelled in an eastern area about 10 miles uh, from the Jordan going eastward to the tracks of the Hejaz Railway, as well as the Golan Heights, land in Lebanon south of the Litani River, and a slice of Sinai. The note was approved by the Council of the League of Nations on the same day as the mandate for Palestine, that's July 24th, 1922. And as I said before, it went into effect two months later on September 23rd. The result was that Eastern Palestine or Transjordan was separated from the mandate of Palestine. Jews were not allowed to settle in or become citizens of Transjordan which ultimately became the country of Jordan. The Jordan River became the clear boundary between Israel and Jordan. The mandate for Palestine gave original Jewish land located east of the Jordan River to the Arabs. This was the original two-state solution made from Jewish land. The mandate for Palestine returned to the Jewish people the land west of the Jordan River, including all of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria for their national home. Nowhere in the mandate for Palestine are Jews excluded from living in Jerusalem, Judea, or Samaria, nor are Arabs given any land in Western Palestine located west of the Jordan River. The nations of the world recognized that the Jewish people had the best claim to the land located on both sides of the Jordan River. But to reward and appease the Arabs, 78% of the land promised to the Jews, that is Eastern Palestine, was taken and given to Hashemite Emir Abdullah bin al Hussein, who later became King Abdullah. Today, the nations of the world want to divide Jewish land again in a second two state solution. This is neither fair nor just because it was already done in 1922. We need to first acknowledge the original two-state solution for Palestine under the mandate for Palestine before we discuss any further solutions. Palestine was always Jewish land. The name Jew comes from Judea. After the failure of the Jewish Bar Kokhba revolt in 136 CE, the Roman emperor Hadrian de-Judaicized the, the name of the land of Israel calling it Syria Palestina, as an insulting memory of the long defunct Philistines, originally a seafaring people who were the arch enemies of the Jews and who disappeared from history more than 700 years earlier in 604 BCE. If there were to be another two-state solution tomorrow, the Jewish people would be tacitly admitting that they have illegally occupied a portion of their own land being given to the Palestinians in this new two-state solution. This is both untrue and would be a terrible stain on Israel and, Jew and on Jewish history, as well as an insult to the Jews who died to build and to defend the state of Israel. The Jews did not steal the land, they own it. This is clear from the mandate for Palestine, unanimously adopted by the nations of the world in the League of Nations, and continued by the UN Charter, Article 80. We must have truth in order to have peace. There can be no peace based on falsehoods. Solutions cannot be built on lies. The state of Israel and the Jewish people need to stand up with dignity and honor for their rights and show how they've been horribly treated by the completely false narrative currently arrayed against them. Did the nations of the world make promises to the Jewish people in the mandate for Palestine? Yes. Were these promises kept by the British as mandatory and by the nations of the world who still falsely claim that Israel is an illegal occupier? No, the promises were not kept. Did hundreds of thousands of Jews tragically die in the Holocaust because the promises of the nations of the world to the Jewish people were not kept? Yes. Can the Jewish people trust the promises of the nations of the world in any future solution to the Israel-Palestine issue? No, not if the prior promises remain broken. 
I'm now going to switch to a, another topic, the status of the land of Israel according to Islamic Sharia law. Why am I discussing this subject? I'm discussing it because the role of Islam is the elephant in the room, in my opinion, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and its important role is ignored by Western commentators and analysts. Have you ever noticed the complete intransigence of the Palestinians in negotiating and agreeing with Israel about any final resolution of the Israel-Palestine issue? The Palestinians rejected every final peace initiative, including the two negotiations held in the United States, first by Ehud Barak of Israel with Yasser Arafat in July 2000, and later by Israel's Ehud Olmert with uh, Palestinian Authority uh, President Mohammed Abbas in November 2007. The Palestinian side made no counteroffer to the generous and flexible terms for peace offered by the Israelis in both cases. Why is that, particularly from a nation whose culture is the bargaining of the bazaar? Here's the answer. The Quran, Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 191 states, drive them out from where they drove you out. This divine commandment from Allah has been consistently interpreted by Muslim scholars for 1400 years to mean that once land is conquered or otherwise obtained by Muslims, it must remain Muslim land forever. Not a single inch of it can be retained by or returned to the infidels. This is the command of Allah in the Quran. Caliph Umar's Muslim army conquered Palestine in the year 636 CE. From the Muslim point of view, and it's correct, it has been under continuous Muslim control since then until the mandate for Palestine took legal effect in 1923, with the exception of the 188-year Crusader period from 1099 to 1187 CE. Islamic conquest of land is, quote, a one-way ticket, according to Bar Ilan University professor Mordechai Kedar. Land can enter Dar al-Islam, al the house of Islam, but it can never exit. For Muslims, according to the Quran, the land of Israel has been and continues to be Muslim land since 636 CE until now. When Yasser Arafat returned from the Camp David negotiations with Ehud Barak, he was asked by an Arab journalist in Arabic, someone I know, why he walked away from the negotiations. He replied, because the Israelis would not give us 100%. Arafat knew that if he had agreed to give up claims to any part of Palestine by recognizing the state of Israel, he would have had his throat cut because of the Quran, Surah 2, verse 191. The Palestinian adv advisor on Islam, Palestinian Authority advisor on Islam, who is also the supreme Sharia judge of the Palestinian Authority, has stated that the entire land of Palestine is a waqf, that's an inalienable religious endowment under Islamic law. Therefore, it is prohibited for Muslims to sell, bestow ownership, or facilitate the occupation of even a millimeter of Palestine by non-Muslims. The Hamas Charter, Article 11, adopts the same position. This is why we always hear the Palestinian claim to all the land, quote, from the river to the sea. Any further partition of the land now will only lead to more demands for further partitions later until the Palestinians following the Quran have 100%. Why was, however, why was Israel able to make peace with Egypt and Jordan? Both Egypt and, jo and, and uh, Jordan took the position that their responsibility was to regain every inch of Egyptian-controlled Muslim land and every inch of Jordanian-controlled 
Muslim land, respectfully, respectively. They succeeded. And that was the price of peace for Israel. They and the other Arab League members decided that it was up to the Palestinians themselves to secure the land upon which Israel exists. Under the mandate for Palestine, which constitutes international law, it is very clear that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. However, under Islamic Sharia law, the reverse is the case. The land is Muslim land forever. Is there any way to reconcile these two positions? The answer, sadly, in my opinion, is no. Islamic jurists will never accept that international law can supersede the immutable Sharia law given by Allah in the Quran. Israel and the Palestinian Muslims will continue to be in a perpetual deadlock on this issue. So what should Israel do? Israeli professor of Arabic and Islamic studies, Mordecai Kadar, has advised that Israel must always be militarily invincible, invincible. In such case, the Palestinian Muslims, who will never give up their position that they own all the land from the river to the sea, however, may decide that the timing simply is not right for today's generation, and from our point of view, hopefully for future generations, in order to fulfill this Islamic commandment. Thank you very much for your attention to today's webinar.